All right, so we're asking the question, how do we know who's truly a Christian? <clears throat> and how do we know that we're real Christians? <clears throat> it's an important subject, this, the subject of assurance of salvation. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, John said, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. That is not a hope so kind of thing. <clears throat> Just about everybody in the world would say, well, I hope I'm going to heaven when I die. If there is such a place, I hope I'm going there. <clears throat> but the Bible doesn't paint it as a hope so kind of thing. The Bible says it is a no. You can know so. And if you don't know so, you're probably not going to go. <clears throat> it's a no so kind of thing. And yet, <clears throat> in a lot of what I would call contemporary Christianity in our culture, assurance is a subject that's often ignored. But the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Because if you're in the faith, if you're saved, <clears throat> then it's a no-so kind of thing. And we've seen <clears throat> in the previous weeks that there's a, there's a basic level of assurance that comes just by knowing what the scripture says about salvation and knowing that you have followed its instructions. For example, <clears throat> John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, <clears throat> but have everlasting life. Have it. Present tense. Right now, have everlasting life. <clears throat> Therefore, we would know that if you believe that verse, and as a result of believing it, you've put your faith in Christ alone for your salvation, then you can be assured that you have eternal life because that's what the scripture says. So that's kind of a, a basic first level knowing that you're saved <clears throat> based on having done what the scripture says. Uh, we call it <clears throat> cognitive assurance. But that by itself isn't really perfect assurance. It's not the perfect assurance, the, the full assurance that Hebrews 10.22 tells us that we should have, which says, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And full assurance requires not just that cognitive assurance from knowing the Bible promises of salvation, <coughs> but also two other elements of, of assurance, which are first the, the sub, somewhat subjective element of assurance, that comes from the witness of the Holy Spirit inside of us, ensuring us uh, uh, that we are saved and giving his into, internal assurance by <clears throat> leading us um, into new thinking and new values, <clears throat> new priorities, and a growing understanding of the word of God and the conviction of our sins and chastisement when we ignore that conviction. Those things are internal assurances from the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and there's also a third element, which we've called the behavioral assurance. <clears throat> and this comes from seeing that our lives are changed as a result of our salvation. And <clears throat> we see that we live differently from the rest of the world. <clears throat> we know <clears throat> even when we sin, when we fail, the Bible teaches us that we do not lose our salvation. Jesus said in John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life. <clears throat> if you could lose it, it wasn't eternal. It was just temporary. But Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So we're exploring <clears throat> how to obtain that full assurance of faith that's demanded in Hebrews 10.22, <clears throat> and we saw that both of the other two elements, the, the Holy Spirit's witness to us and the Holy Spirit's work in us, are displayed right in that same verse, Hebrews 10.22, <coughs> because it says it's by having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscious, conscience. <clears throat> That's that internal aspect, our heart being assured that we no longer feel condemnation from God, our consciousness of our own evil uh, uh, is has been removed. Not not when we fail, when we sin, uh, but we no longer have a consciousness of being condemned by God, of being without God. 
It says, and our bodies washed with pure water, which denotes that external aspect, our external mode of living, our new lifestyle. It's the outward expression of the transformation of our minds by the word of God and by the spirit of God. So as God works inside of us, it expresses itself in our style of living, in our manner of living. So let's say again, there is no assurance of salvation without sanctification without a changed perspective in your life, without changed values, without changed living, a changed life. <clears throat> Those are all expressions <clears throat> of a change on the inside. So we looked at Romans 8, <clears throat> verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. <clears throat> so if you have experienced in your life the, the direction and the leading of the Spirit of God, then verse 14 says, you're God's child. That is an evidence of salvation. If you've seen the Spirit of God uh, directing you to people, to places, uh, <clears throat> perhaps through the actions of other Christians or through the circumstances of your life, and these things then put you in a place, in a position to receive the blessings of God, that's being led by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Verses 15 and 16 of Romans 8 says, For ye, are, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. <clears throat> so there is this amazing <clears throat> internal assurance from the Holy Spirit that we are God's children. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's enhanced when we read and we study the Word of God. <clears throat> <clears throat> now you can tell somebody <clears throat> who's not saved, who's not born again, about this, this amazing internal assurance, <clears throat> but they won't have a clue what you're talking about because <clears throat> they've never experienced it. <clears throat> And I know it sounds kind of trite to say you've got to experience it to understand it. And even, I think, once you experience you still don't really understand it. <clears throat> but it really is something that somebody who is saved and has experienced the internal assurance of the Holy Spirit, they get it, <clears throat> and people who are lost just don't understand it. <clears throat> they just don't understand it. They may think that it's, that it's confidence. <clears throat> um, that it has to do with you and your thinking, <clears throat> but it's not. It's the assurance of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we also talked about the working of the Spirit of God in our conscience and in our emotions, <clears throat> so that when we fail God, when we sin, we feel the weight of that sin. We feel the displeasure, the, the, the displeasure that we've created in God over what we've done, and it distresses us. <clears throat> That in itself is another assurance that we belong to God. <clears throat> and when we have burdens and overwhelming problems, we feel this longing to go into the presence of God, to pray to God, <clears throat> to bring the problems to God. And that again is an assurance that we belong to him. And so Paul says that although you can know that you're saved if you just take the promises of the word of God mentally, cognitively. You can also know you're saved if in your heart you see the, the moving and the working and the unfolding of the circumstances of your life by the Spirit of God as he directs you. But there is this third element of assurance, the element of assurance that takes us back to our text that we've been looking at, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. 1 John 2, 3 to 6 says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. <clears throat> so now we're coming to uh, the objective, uh, the outward, the visible proof that somebody is a Christian. <clears throat> the work of the Holy Spirit in prompting us and directing us and moving us and using our desires and our longings and our hunger for intimacy with God, all those things are internal. <clears throat> They're invisible. They happen inside of us. But here is a visible way uh, of seeing evidence 
proof of your salvation, proof of somebody's salvation, a visible path to assurance <coughs> that will lead to the full assurance talked about in Hebrews 10.22. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see this. This is... <coughs> This is the behavior test by which you can know that you're a believer. <clears throat> the behavior test that shows the fruit of somebody's profession of faith, that there's reality to it. Verse 3, and hereby we do know that we know him. <clears throat> this is finally now getting to the heart of the book of 1 John. <clears throat> the key verse I said of, of, of 1 John is First John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. And the verse after it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So John is saying, I want you to have that confidence, that you can go into God's presence with all that's on your heart and know that he will hear you. He's saying, this is the confidence that arises out of assurance that you know him. And he says, that's why I'm writing all this to you. <clears throat> so he starts out by saying, and hereby we do know that we know him. How to know that you really know him. How to know that you have a true relationship with God. That word know, <clears throat> the word is Guinness <clears throat> uh, It's in the present tense <clears throat> in the Greek language, meaning a continuing action. We continually know. It means we perceive knowledge by experience. It, it refers to something that we are experiencing on a continuing basis. We know and 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 we, because we have experience after experience after experience after experience that assures us that we know God. <clears throat> That's what he's saying. We can have a measure of assurance by believing what the scripture says. We can have a measure of assurance by the invisible, the subjective, the mighty work of the Spirit of God moving in our lives. But this knowledge, <clears throat> this third kind of knowledge, we actually experience. It's the test that brings us to the full assurance. And it's critical because unless you see this in your life, you're going to question your salvation. You're going to question whether the Holy Spirit really is leading in your life. And that's what we said earlier when we said there's no assurance of salvation apart from sanctification. And hereby we do know that we know him. You could put it another way. This phrase means, by this particular piece of evidence that I'm about to reveal, we know that we have come to know him. We know that we have come to know him. <clears throat> because now, <clears throat> John uses a different form of the Greek word for to know. And because it looks at a past action that has continuing results. That's what it means. By this we continue to know that some point in the past we came to know him because we know that in the past we came to know him because we keep getting pieces of evidence over and over and over and over throughout our life <clears throat> that gives us that assurance. <coughs> so what is it? What is that piece of evidence <clears throat> that tells us that at some point in the past we came to know him? And it says right there, if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. <clears throat> so John is... <clears throat> Starting now, focusing on this idea of knowing. Forty times in this, this little epistle, <clears throat> it uses some form of the word know. Either uh, gnosko or oida. Those are the two main Greek words for know. And they're here over 40 times in this book. <clears throat> and as I said, the theme of the book is 1 John 5.13, that ye may know that you have eternal life. So this whole book is focused on knowing. Now he set it against the backdrop of people who thought that they had attained the true and the elevated knowledge. <clears throat> the people we talked about, we referred, referred to them as Gnostics. <clears throat> Even though that word didn't come along for a couple of centuries later, but it was referring to these kind of people who thought that they had a superior knowledge to everybody else, that they had a higher knowledge, and uh, so they were above everybody else. <clears throat> they thought that they had a special kind of knowledge that they had attained and that had elevated them above everybody else. <clears throat> and those kind of people, they're still in our world today. The ascended masters, sometimes they're called. The gurus, the mystics, these people who are enlightened, so they believe, in the religious world. <clears throat> and they were around in John's day too. <clears throat> they were sort of, <clears throat> again, 
pre-Gnostics, because like I said, that word didn't come along for a couple of centuries, but <clears throat> it's all based on this, this word for, for knowing <clears throat> of Gnosis. They were the Gnostics, <clears throat> means to know. They thought themselves to be people who were in the know, that they had a, 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 a secret knowledge. <clears throat> And the remnants of the, that Gnostic mentality still around today in, in modern New Age thinking and in modern philosophies and some parts of psychology. And it even shows up in some of the secret societies like the, the, the Masons, the Freemasons. They believe that they have a secret knowledge. <clears throat> and it's the belief that there is some kind of secret knowledge <clears throat> that, that appears in all kinds of different religions. So there are people in John's day who thought they had this secret knowledge, this transcendent knowledge, <clears throat> that, that they had elevated themselves above the hoi polloi, above the common people, above the crowd, <clears throat> above the riffraff of life. And it really was <clears throat> a system of salvation by knowledge, <clears throat> but it was a self-knowledge, a self-knowing. They had a system of self-salvation through this <clears throat> attained knowledge, <clears throat> and there were two ways that they thought that the knowledge could be attained obtained. Some of them attained it by reason. They believed <clears throat> that they could just think themselves into the supernatural realm. So they believed and put it all together in their minds. <clears throat> Although whatever insight they ever actually achieved was no doubt gained from demons. <clears throat> and the rest of them came to their knowledge, not by reason, but by experience. <clears throat> they engaged themselves in every imaginable kind of experience. Drugs, alcohol, sex, any kind of euphoric type of experience <clears throat> in which they assumed they were elevating themselves to another dimension. <clears throat> they believed they had ascended to some high uh, esoteric transcendent knowledge. <clears throat> Knowing was their way to self-salvation and it was their way to superiority. <clears throat> it was their way to religious and mental advancement. So the whole idea of this secret transcendent knowledge it developed along two lines <clears throat> in the greek culture <clears throat> one you could maybe call the philosophical line classic greek philosophy that you could <clears throat> was the idea that you could eventually grasp the universal truths behind the visible world simply by thinking about it long enough and hard enough <clears throat> and logically enough <clears throat> um, that you could reach ultimate truth and people like Plato and Aristotle and even modern philosophers of, of our day all come out of that same idea that man can sort out the universal realities <clears throat> um, that are behind the world that we see. <clears throat> that's what they believe. <clears throat> and that's really what philosophy is. <clears throat> philosophy is the attempt to understand the invisible world, <clears throat> the, the realities behind what you can see and feel and touch and taste and smell. <clears throat> That's philosophy. It's the elevation of the mind. And <clears throat> after the Dark Ages philosophy, <clears throat> which existed before that, came resurging back through uh, <clears throat> the Enlightenment, what we call the Renaissance. <clears throat> and philosophy came back really into its heyday <clears throat> um, after the Renaissance. We got <clears throat> philosophers like Kant and Hegel and Descartes all the way up to today, and it affects practically everything in our modern society, in our modern culture, that we don't even realize it. <clears throat> but there's something you need to know regarding philosophy. Knowing by means of philosophy has absolutely no connection whatsoever to morality. If you study the people who shape the Western world with their philosophies, you will see that they lived wicked, wretched, immoral, uh, grossly wicked lives, more than you would imagine. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> if you doubt this, you can get a book called The Intellectuals by a guy by the name of Paul Johnson who describes these people, these Western philosophers, and their manner of living. <clears throat> They affected the world with their philosophies, but they lived wicked lives. They saw themselves as ascended individuals who had attained the knowledge of universal truths <clears throat> that were behind the visible world that we saw. And yet, <clears throat> they had absolutely no connection. Their philosophies had no connection to how they lived. <clears throat> the other strain of Greek philosophy that found, 
<clears throat> found its way into culture was not through the mind, but through the body. And it came to the place where it took on all forms of hedonism. Hedonism, <clears throat> if you're familiar with that word or not familiar with it, it's defined as the pursuit of pleasure and sensual self-indulgence. And hedon hedonism <clears throat> basically said that fulfillment is in feelings. Fulfillment comes from feelings. <clears throat> and is that a part of our culture? Well, you ever hear this phrase? Whatever feels good, what's the rest of it? Do it. Yeah, <clears throat> that's hedonism. The Greek philosophers who pursued this practice, they believed that ultimate truth <clears throat> wasn't gained rationally, but through experiences, <clears throat> through, through, be, um, through fulfilling every single emotion, fulfilling every desire, every longing. <clears throat> but we know that such a pursuit leads to a life of complete emptiness. And we know this because the wisest man in all the world decided to test that philosophy. Who was that? <clears throat> Solomon. <clears throat> what was the book he wrote about testing that philosophy? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. He said, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. <clears throat> and then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. <clears throat> he did everything that he wanted to do. He got himself every because he was also the richest man in the entire world at that time. So there wasn't anything that he wanted in this material world that he couldn't get. So he got himself everything that his heart imagined. And then he said, it's vanity. That word means emptiness. It didn't fulfill anything. And vexation of spirit, it's depression. Depression. There was no profit from any of it. <clears throat> it left him empty. I've said before, it seems that the only, you know, everybody's heard the phrase, money can't buy happiness, but it seems like the only people that ever really seem to believe that are rich people who have found out for themselves that money can't buy happiness. Most other people think, well, maybe it can at least rent it for a while. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So there's these two strains of philosophy <clears throat> that you come to knowing through the mind or that you come to knowing through the body, through the impulses, through the drives. <clears throat> but just like philosophy, hedonism, which is simply another kind of philosophy, had absolutely no connection to morality. The philosophies <clears throat> the, of uh, the world have no required moral standards. <clears throat> and certainly those who live for pleasure have no moral standards. <clears throat> so. In neither case, whether you're coming to this ascended knowledge through your mind or through your body, there's just no connection between that kind of knowing and how you lived your life. And the reality is that those two strains are still with us. The first one through the mind in this time is called modernism. Have you heard that phrase before? The modern age modernism? If you look up modernism in Wikipedia, you'll find it, it's defined as a notable characteristic of modernism is self-consciousness, a focus on self and a turning inward, self-consciousness. <clears throat> so modernism is just a reincarnation of that ancient philosophy that humans can reach transcendent knowledge through their own thinking. And the second line of thinking <clears throat> that you can reach enlightenment through body and feelings is now today called postmodernism. It's another word. <clears throat> Uh, phrase that we've heard, postmodernism. And again, you look this up on Wikipedia, it says postmodernism embraces self-referentiality. Self okay, what in the world is that? Self-referentiality means you are whatever you say you are. Have you heard that? You are whatever you say you are. <clears throat> it embraces self-referentiality 
epistemological relativos, relativism, epistemological relativism, which is another phrase which means truth is relative. Truth is relative. <clears throat> so postmodernism re embraces self-referentiality, epistemological relativism, and moral relative moral relativism, meaning that there is no absolute right or wrong. Going on, it says, it, it opposes the universal validity of binary options, right versus wrong, good versus evil. It opposes the idea of a stable identity, of any kind of hierarchy or categorization. You are whatever you identify as. Hmm. <clears throat> We are living in postmodern America. <clears throat> that is the philosophy of our age. You could also call it, we are living in post-Christian America. <clears throat> because there was a time where, by and large, Christian values <clears throat> were the norm in our society. That is not true anymore. Now we live in postmodern America. In either case, whether it's modernism or postmodernism, Knowledge through thinking, <clears throat> knowledge <clears throat> through personal experience, they have no connection to behavior. The rationalist lives in sin, and the hedonist lives in sin, and their philosophies have absolutely no bearing on how they live. And folks, we are out of time once again. <clears throat> so, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll pick it up next week.